If you're hanging around this evening, we're going to be in Lamentations. Specifically, we're going to be in Lamentations chapter 3. We will not, unless I'm greatly surprised, we will not finish chapter 3, but we'll make a dent. Mike, I'm a little hot in my own ears. Lamentations chapter 3. The book of Lamentations, obviously, is Jeremiah lamenting, thus the name. He's weeping, he's sorrowing. Occasionally, he's shaking his fist in anger over what he has witnessed. The destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. I say Jeremiah, nowhere in the book does it say Jeremiah, but we attribute the book to Jeremiah for reasons that we've talked about. And Jeremiah, in, in writing the book, in giving us these words, he writes in various voices. Sometimes Jeremiah, a prophet, speaks as a prophet in the voice of the Lord. Sometimes Jeremiah gives voice, he personifies Jerusalem, and he laments as if he's speaking for the city itself and the temple itself. Sometimes he, he gives voice to, to what some commentators call every man, the man on the street, the person on the street, the people of Jerusalem. And often, well, not often, sometimes, also is what I meant to say, also, he speaks in his own voice and shares his own heart and allows us to taste his tears, as it were. And that's going to be the case tonight as we turn to chapter 3. Even from the very first words of the chapter, this next poem, remember Lamentations is five chapters, it's five poems, it's five funeral dirges. And as we begin this next one, we read, I am the man. That's different than what we saw in chapters 1 and 2. It's a different beginning. Chapters 1 and 2 both began with Jeremiah saying, how? And we've commented how that's actually an alternate title in some Hebrew manuscripts. How? How did this happen? As if Jeremiah is, is struggling to come to terms with the, the scope of the destruction. And he knows the answer to the question. He knows it's the unrepentant sin of Judah. He knows it's the priests and the princes and the people who all turn their hearts from the Lord, but still the sheer magnitude of it has him in the first two chapters saying, oh, how? How did we get here? How did all of this happen? Well, here in this chapter, Jeremiah begins a little bit differently because he's going to get very, very personal. He's going to talk about the impact of the, the siege and the destruction and the devastation and the deportation of, of the people. He's going to talk about the impact that it's had on him. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath, God's wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he's turned his hand against me time and time again through the day. Remember chapters 1 and 2 were 22 verses. So are chapters 4 and 5. 22 verses, why 22 verses? Because each of those poems is an acrostic. Each verse begins with a subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If it were English, it would be verse 1 and all, it begins with A, and verse 2 begins with B, and so forth. And we've speculated maybe that, that A to Z uh, acrostic is intended to signal, it's intended to convey the comprehensive extent of the destruction that Jeremiah is speaking of. It's, it's thorough, it's, it's everywhere, it's everything from A to Z. Well, chapter 3 doesn't have 22 verses, it has 66 verses. It has 66 triads of three verses each. And each of the lines in each triad begins with the same letter. So it's the same alphabetical pattern, just extended. So here, verse 1 in English, I. Verse 2 in English, he. Verse 3 in English, surely. Those all in Hebrew begin with the same letter. They begin with Aleph. But right off the bat, verses 1 through 3, we catch the depth of Jeremiah's sorrow, don't we? 
Because remember, he's the prophet who for 40 years God has revealed himself to. For 40 years God has spoken through. He's a prophet who for four decades God has revealed his light through. And here, in contrast to that, he's speaking about the darkness that has enveloped him. The darkness that overtook him along with the rest of the city. The darkness that he suffered right alongside his countrymen. We also have a a hint of the distance that Jeremiah is experiencing. Notice in verses 1 through 3, it's he has led me. He has turned his hand against me. And in the first 16 verses, that's going to be the pattern. Jeremiah is not going to say God. He's not going to say the Lord. He's not going to say you. He's speaking about God and not to God. He's speaking about his alienation, his frustration. He's not talking to God about it. He's just venting about it. And I think maybe in the process expressing he's revealing to us the the damage that's been done to his relationship the distance that he feels from god he doesn't even want to say his name verse four he again that that same he has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones verse five he's besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe he's set me in dark places like the dead of long ago He's feeling the stress in his body. He's internalizing the disaster, the external wreckage. He's he's, he's internalized it. He he feels broken. He feels tired. He feels old. Verse verse 5, he surrounded me with bitterness and woe. Um, Another way to express that is he's, he's poisoned me. The poison is seeping in through my skin, and it ends up with him in dark places, in a pit, in a grave. And that that same theme, that that same feeling carries over to this next triplet. He's hedged me in so I cannot get out. He's made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He's blocked my ways with hewn stone. He's made my paths crooked. He's weighed down in heavy, verse 7. If you've ever experienced true depression, it feels like gravity is like Jupiter gravity. You can't lift your arms sometimes. Verse 8, it feels like his prayers are bouncing off of the ceiling. They're not getting through. And verse 8, the road to God as he seeks God, he feels like he's in a maze or a labyrinth. It's just one dead end after one dead end, one, one false turn after one blind alley. He's crying out, as it were, in the dark. God, where are you? I'm looking for you. I can't find you. And verse 10, the frustration continues to build. He's been like, to me, a bear lying in wait, like a lion in ambush. He's turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces. He's made me desolate. He's bent his bow and set me up as a target for the arrow. The frustration continuing to build. Rewind to the the first couplet. He speaks of the distance that he feels from God. And then in the second couplet, verses 4, 5, and 6, it's stress, it's depression. And then verses 7, 8, and 9, it was separation and silence and God hiding himself. And, And now it's even escalated. God isn't just hiding from him. He feels like God has turned against him. God is laying in wait for him. He's he's stalked him and ambushed him, verse 10. Ambushed him, verse 10. Ripped him apart, verse 11. Ripped him apart, left him alone. And then verse 12, he says, God used me for target practice. He left me no way of escape. He ambushed me. He completely overtook me. I didn't have a chance. There was no way of escape. God ambushed me and he beat on me. Verse 13, he's caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. If, 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 this, were, if this were a, a gunshot instead of an arrow, he's a, he'd say he put, he, put, he put his gun to my temple. He got so close that he couldn't possibly miss. I've become the ridicule of all my people, verse 14. 
their taunting song all the day. He's filled me with bitterness. He's made me to drink wormwood. God wounded me. He says, verse 15, carrying over from verse 14, God wounded me, and then he allowed my own people to mock and ridicule me. He wounded me, and then he let my own people surround me and make fun of me. And that's not a new thing for Jeremiah. Remember when we were reading the book of Jeremiah, from time to time he would lament, God, you've made me a prophet to people who don't want to hear it. I speak the truth that you give me, and they turn around and they mock me for it. Now they're raging against me. Jeremiah is saying, I can't win for losing. I told them that this was going to happen, and now that it's happened, they're raging against me. They're saying, oh, why, why didn't you warn us, Jeremiah? And he's saying, I tried to, but they just shout at me louder. I had a boss like that once. Something, something would go sideways, and he'd say, why didn't, why didn't you see this coming? I did. Why didn't you tell me? I did. When did you tell me? Here and here and here. Well, you should have made me listen. <laughs> you should have tried harder. And, 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 and that's what Jeremiah is experiencing from, from, his, from those who are, who are left in the city, those who haven't been deported. Why didn't you tell us, Jeremiah? I tried. Why didn't you warn us? I did. Why didn't you warn us in a way that we would believe? Like, that's my fault. He's bitter, verse 15, because he's abused, he's, he's attacked, he's forsaken, and he doesn't even get the satisfaction of saying, I told you so. Not that it would do any good, because of the destruction and the desolation that he's experiencing, not just witnessing, but experiencing, that exceeds any gloating. Verse 16, he's also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You've moved my soul far from peace. I've forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. This is the climax. This is the peak of, of Jeremiah's lament, his, his first person lament to the Lord. It's the climax, and it's the most violent, right? It's the most vivid language. It's the it's the most graphic description of, of the physical assault that he's, he's feeling. He's saying, God, you forced me to eat rocks until my teeth broke. You forced me to chew rocks until my teeth shattered in my mouth, and then you ground me into dust, and you left me a pile of ashes. You did this, Jeremiah. He's shouting at God. Verse 17, you did this, you did this, you took away everything good that I had. Verse 18, and after you took away everything good that I had, you took away my hope. I think there's an interesting touch point here between the ash heap he's describing that makes us think of someone else who ended up on an ash heap. He's kind of having a Job experience right now, right? But did, did you notice what happened I said verse 16 was, was the climax, was the pinnacle of his lament. Did you notice what happened in verse 17? Because it's big. If, 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 you, if, you, if, you, if you check down and said, okay, this is Lamentations, it hurts, it's bad, it's bad, it hurts, it hurts, it's bad. It, change of pace, change of direction here. Verse 17, something big happens. For the first time in this poem, he addresses God directly. It's no longer third person. It's no longer he. Verse 17, it's you. And verse 18, he uses God's name. Remember when we see Lord in, in small caps in the New King James translation, that, that Lord, the, the small caps indicates the name of the Lord in the Hebrew, the tetragrammatron, the YHWH have perished from Yahweh. Verse 17, something changed. He's saying you instead of he. Verse 18, he's using God's name. And that's not a coincidence because the tone is about to change. And I want to hit pause here. When we were in Isaiah, when we were in Jeremiah, we kind of got into a pattern of just verse-by-verse -verse exposition 
Because reading Isaiah and Jeremiah, that, that's some dense stuff. And there's a lot of figurative language, poetical language, and there's also a lot of sussing out, okay, is this short-term prophecy, is this long-term prophecy, or is this just present history unfolding? And so a, a lot of our study through Isaiah and Jeremiah focused on just interpretation. What, what are we reading here so that we, we can read with understanding? Lamentations is a little less cryptic. It's poetic language, to be sure, but it's not as difficult to unravel. So I think we can pause here mid-chapter and, and camp out for a little bit and talk about something really important. Glance ahead to verse 20. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies were not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It's good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We'll come back and unpack that in a moment. Kind of startling in the middle of Lamentations to find great is your faithfulness, unless you didn't know that it was waiting for us here. But more startling still is how it, it just springs up suddenly, it springs up abruptly after the passage we just read. And, and what we just read, verses 20 to 26, it's going to continue straight through to verse 39. And, and what a contrast to the screed we've been reading up to this point. I mean, this is a really abrupt shift, right? What happened? What changed? What, what shifted Jeremiah's perspective? Verse 17, Jeremiah and God started talking. Which shouldn't be a shock to any of us. We've all experienced that in human relationships, haven't we? Get tangled up with someone, get sideways with someone, get good and bent at someone, and you stop talking. Because you can't talk to them. There's no point in talking to them. Why would I talk to them? How do, you, how do you expect me to talk to them after what they did? I've done that. I've done that with people in this room. Living in New Jersey, I did that with another pastor. We did it to each other, actually. Pastor at another church. We didn't talk for more than a year. We were each convinced that the other had betrayed, betrayed us. And so why would I talk to him? They're not worth talking to. I was convinced of that in my heart. He was convinced of that in his heart. We went a year without talking. Just quietly fuming. You ever been in that place? Yeah. <laughs> Friend, co-worker, family. No one can wound us as deeply as family, right? And you know what it's like. You know what happens over time. The perception of what happened the magnitude of the injury in your mind just grows. Every time you think about it, every time you remember it, every time you rehearse it, it gets bigger and bigger. Look, look again, verses 1 through 18, as, as Jeremiah talks and talks and talks some more about what he experienced Excuse me, at the hands of the Lord. It went from feelings of depression to oppression, to destruction, to betrayal. It grew and grew and grew over, over 18 verses. It got bigger and bigger. Just like every time we, we sit and we stew, we perseverate was the, mom, the word my mom would use. You're perseverating over that. I don't know what that means, mom, but I know I'm mad. <laughs> But, but as, as, we, as we repeat it in our mind, the wound get, gets deeper, the offense grows larger, the mitigating circumstances, if there were any, get, get, get eclipsed, and the chasm between us gets wider. The more we think about it with, without talking to, to the person that, that we're sideways with, the, the, the more we, we go over it and just keep our own counsel with it, the, the, the crime against us seems more heinous and, and our innocence seems more obvious until the whole thing becomes a test of other relationships. It almost becomes a referendum. Are you my friend? If, 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 
you can't be my friend if you don't see my side of this. You better be on my side of this. If, if you don't see this my way, and, and, and well, I, don't know, I don't know how I can be friends with you if you don't agree with me about this. What breaks the cycle? If, if, if anything's going to, because sometimes nothing can. But if anything is going to, what is it that breaks the cycle? It's dialogue. It's one person approaching the other. Maybe both people are approaching each other, but at the very least, it's one person approaching the other and, and one person saying to someone, hey, here's how I'm feeling. Here, here's how I experienced what happened. Here's, here's what it was to be me. What's your perspective? How have you been experiencing this? How, how are you making sense of this? Sometimes the other person won't talk. Won't acknowledge that there's anything to talk about. Or won't acknowledge that there's two, two perspectives. Not, not every overture ends in reconciliation, sadly. But every reconciliation starts with communication, right? Not every, not every hey, can we talk about this, it, it doesn't always work. Not every overture, not every attempt at peacemaking ends in reconciliation. But every reconciliation starts with communication. Hey, can we talk about this? Which I think is why God makes such an emphatic repeated point about this in his word. Again and again, Old Testament and New Testament. In the poetical books, in the historical books, in the law, in the prophets, in the letters, in the gospels, talk to people, not about people. We associate that with Matthew 18, but it's way more places than that. Matthew 18 is the places that Jesus teaches us, go to people. But that resonates all through Scripture. Why? Because if anything is going to change for the better, that's how it's going to start. Two people talking and figuring out, wait, I thought, I, I thought you were wrong, but really I was wrong. I thought you were wrong, but we, really we were both wrong. I thought you were wrong, and, and you were, but I didn't give you a chance to, to ask for forgiveness. See, absent communication, the only thing that's likely to happen is for the pain to get deeper, the bitterness to get greater, the, the scope of it all to get wider, and, and the desire for vengeance to get hotter. Why is gossip so high on God's, on God's most wanted list? Old Testament and New Testament, when we read lists of sins, when Moses is rattling them off, when Paul is rattling them off, gossip, high on the list. Why? Because talking about people instead of two people hinders reconciliation, and God is a God of reconciliation. Talking to people and not about people gets in the way of friendship. It gets in the way of relationship. It gets in the way of fellowship. It gets way in the way of community. It gets in the way of everything that God is about. Not every approach is going to result in reconciliation, but every reconciliation starts with an approach. Hey, can we talk about this? And when we approach God and say, I'm really hurt, I'm really mad, I do not understand this, when we approach God in humility and honesty, honesty about God... I'm in pain right here. I'm deeply hurt. I'm afraid of you and not in a good way. I've been trying to live for you and, and, and everything just, just turned to garbage. Whatever we're feeling. When we approach God in honesty, but, but also in humility. Sharing with him honestly where we're coming from, but also honestly willing to listen to let God speak to us about what it is to be him in whatever transaction is, has got us twisted up. If we're willing to let God speak to our heart, if we're willing to let God speak through his word, good things happen. Why? Because God is always, always interested in reconciliation. Verse 19. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. 
Jeremiah is talking about what it's been like to be him. And, he, and he's, essentially he's saying, do what you always did, get what you always got. He's describing himself, obsessively replaying again and again the, the hurt, obsessively revisiting over and over his grievance, replaying it, revisiting it, reinforcing it. It's true. It's so true. It's very true. And nothing has ever been this true. What breaks the cycle? Verse 21, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Other translations, yet this I call to mind. What did he call to mind? Yet, therefore, what changed? What interrupted the cycle? Verse 22, through the Lord's mercies were not consumed because his compassions fail not. He remembered God, God's mercy. He remembered the fact God could have destroyed Judah utterly, completely, entirely. Could have obliterated the Jewish people entirely from the face of the planet. He had the power to do so, obviously. He had reason to do so. The Jewish people sinned against their creator after the line being drawn. This is the law. Stay on the side of the line. After being warned, you're on the wrong side of the line. After being reminded, the line is still there. After being corrected, let's walk you back onto the right side of the line. After the example of the northern kingdom, after Israel, the northern kingdom was obliterated by, by the Assyrians, God could have destroyed Judah, all of its people, and been perfectly just in doing so. And that's what turned Jeremiah around. He remembered God's mercy. He called to mind God's mercy. When? Right after he started to address God. Right after he said, you, Yahweh. As soon as he began not just to gripe and complain about God, but talk to God. That forced him to consider who he was talking to and what he knew about him, what God had spent 40 years revealing to Jeremiah about himself, what the word and the prophets who came before Jeremiah taught him about this God. Talking to God forced Jeremiah to remember who he was addressing, and he had to admit that through all of the pain and all of the destruction and all of the everything, the God he was talking to was ultimately good. The God that he was frustrated with, even in this destruction, ultimately was merciful. Verse 22, through the Lord's mercies were not consumed because his compassions Fail not. It's not about what we deserve. It's about who he is. His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He's talking to God now. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord Yahweh is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Mercies. Translated elsewhere, loving kindness or steadfast love. They're eternal. They're God's attributes. It's on that basis that God made promises to his people Israel, and we know that God keeps his promises. Therefore, I have hope. And that's hope in the biblical sense. That's, that's not hope that's uncertain. That's hope that gives us the reason to keep hanging on because better things are coming. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It's good that one should hope and wait quietly. It's arranged in triplets, but the, the, the break in theme doesn't always fall neatly a, after, after three. We saw that earlier between verses 20 and 21, right? Verse 21 introduces 22, 23, 24. Here again, 27 starts a new thought. It's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent. 
because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his check to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. Good to learn at a young age, Jeremiah says, to accept chastening. God chastens those that he loves. Good to learn that early. Good to get used to that. And by extension, Jeremiah is saying, it's good to learn to bear the afflictions of this world, the afflictions of this life that may or may not be just. Because whatever they are, if God hasn't authored them, he's allowed them. And if God has allowed them, he will use them. He will redeem them. He will not waste them. So know that, Jeremiah is, is saying, to himself as much as anybody. To, it's good to bear the reproach, to accept the correction, to receive punishment. And rather than, than, than get lost in the unpleasantness of all of it, to meditate on the reality, on the truth, the eternal truth, whatever it is, God is going to use it. Whether intended for evil or intended for good, God will use it. And ultimately, he'll deliver us from it. Verse 31, the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. That's who he is. For he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God's not capricious. He's not arbitrary. He's not sadistic. He's a God of promise, and one of his promises is that he brings beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. And that when he afflicts, it's always for correction, not destruction. Verse 34, to crush under one's feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the justice due a man before the face of the Most High, or subvert a man in his cause, the Lord does not approve. Jeremiah is continuing to reflect positively now on God's character. Who is God? He's reminding himself. He's God who cares about those who are in chains. God is interested in the treatment of prisoners, verse 34. God doesn't approve when the accused are denied their rights, verse 35. God is grieved when anyone has refused access to justice, verse 36. He's turning around. He's saying not only is that not who God is, but abusing prisoners denying the accused their rights, denying anybody access to justice. That's not only not who God is, that's what God hates. Who is he who speaks and it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? Why should a living man complain, a man, for the punishment of his sins? God who said, let there be light, verse 37. God who spoke creation into existence didn't create evil. He declares evil, verse 38. God didn't create evil. He defines what is good and what is evil. And when men choose evil, who are we? Jeremiah is asking, who is man? Who is humanity? Who is God's creation to complain? The word murmur there is the same word that we see in Numbers 11. Those murmuring after, after they left Egypt. Murmuring, what is this wilderness? Where is the food? Who is this Moses? They're murmuring, what, about how God deals with evil? Evil is rebellion against the very nature of God, and it's, it's denial of the goodness of God. And Jeremiah is, 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 is coming around. He's rebuking himself. He's reminding himself it's okay to have feelings about the hurt that we experience in this world. It's okay to not enjoy chastisement. It's okay to be honest that the hurt hurts and that the pain is painful. But what we need to do is go to God with that and tell God that it hurts and tell God that it's painful and tell God we don't see you in this right now. Not just accuse him. Not just say, he's what's wrong. 
He's who's evil. He's what's the problem. But to say, God, it feels like you're doing me dirty here. I know you're good, but this feels like the opposite of good. This feels like you have it out for me. Because if we go to God and say, God, this is what it's like to be me, and then listen, God will tell us what it is to be him. If we say you instead of he, God will gently correct our perception. He'll remind us of his mercy, and he'll turn us around. You ever have a child mad at you? Good and mad at you? Red face screaming mad at you? <laughs> Michaela used to cry so hard in, in anger she'd pass out. She'd literally get just so, so red faced and rage. Ann and I would look at each other, okay, wait for it. Three, two, and then her head was sort of lol. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it was the funniest thing and the saddest thing all at the same time. But what do you do when a small child is just furious after they've screamed and raged and cried and thrown a fit? Can I talk now? Are you willing to listen? And sometimes the answer is no! They slam off, they storm off to the room, slam the door off its hinges because they're more interested in being right than they are in being reconciled. They're more interested in staying stuck than hearing sense. But eventually, usually, <laughs> you hear the, the soft footsteps. Not the stomp, 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 stomp. But the pad, 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 pad. Fine. Okay. <sighs> what? And, and if they're really listening, that's when things start to get better. Because that small pile of rage and fury remembers deep down all you've ever tried to do is love them. When we're willing to go to God with footsteps that are pat, 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 pat. And say, fine. Say what you have to say, Lord. It's your turn, God. And listen. That's when things will start getting better. Because he'll gently remind us and, and point us back to things that we know. Things that he's proved over and over. And all he's ever done is try to love us. Lord, we lose sight of that. And thank you that your mercy is big enough to encompass that. We can't get so mad at you that you give up on us. However sad, mad, enraged, frustrated, disappointed, bitter, however deep we go into, into a pit of, of pain and anger, your mercies are greater. Your patience is greater. You're God who waits. <laughs> you outweigh every one of our tantrums. And you will remind us, and you do remind us. And you usually use your word and and you couple it with our own experiences. We've proved over and over who you are. We've seen again and again your goodness. We know that we're not having this conversation apart from your mercy. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you're God who brings us back. God who lets us pound our fists and stomp our feet and speaks words 
of hope and healing.